That's it, seven seconds. Psychologists tell us that when someone meets another person, within seven seconds of meeting that person, they've already been stereotyped, a judgment has been made about them, a generalization uh, has come to that person's mind about that individual. Some psychologists push it even further. And they say within one-tenth of one second of seeing someone, a judgment is made. For people who have a face for radio like me, that's kind of scary. And we really can't do much about that initial impression of one-tenth of one second. But there is a lot that we can do within seven seconds of meeting someone to make a positive impact upon those individuals. One of the best things that we do at Baldwin High School is that before graduating, every senior does a senior exit interview. And at the end of May, these seniors get nervous. They're a little apprehensive about the senior exit interview. Uh, maybe it's because they're just nervous about where they are in their life. Or maybe they're nervous for the interview because they've never interviewed before. And the fear of the unknown is taking over them. Now my job as a senior teacher is to kind of calm them down, prepare them for the interview. And one of the things that I do is just try to change their mindset as to interviewing. Because most of the students feel as though they're counter punchers. They go into an interview, they sit down, and all they do is respond to the questions. And what I have to do is kind of change their outlook of an interview. Because as an interviewee, you should attack that interview. You should control that interview. And a lot of students have problems with this. They're thinking, Mr. Graff, you're crazy. They're the ones interviewing me. They're the ones in control. Well, in actuality, I give them some concrete things that they can do and that all of us can do within a few seconds of meeting someone to make a positive, lasting impact upon those particular individuals. So many times as teachers, we just say to our students, well, be confident. Have a presence. Have that it factor. But what, what does that mean? You're not telling us how to do that. So I've come up with four very simple steps that students can use in an interview or that all of us can use when we meet people to make a positive impact upon them. The first, and this is something that personally I struggle with a little bit as well, is I tend to hunch over, all right? And Sprite used to have uh, an adage that image is everything. And uh, one of the things that we can do to exude confidence, to make a positive first impression upon people, is simply have proud shoulders. Keep our chest out, our shoulders back. And even if we aren't confident, people may see us and say, wow, that person is confident, simply by the way in which they walk. The second thing that we can do, and I tell my students this, marry their eyes. Look deep into those eyes. Make eye contact. Own that connection that you're making with individuals. Now, as a teacher, from my perspective, I know on a daily basis when I ask a question in class, who is confident, who is ready to answer that particular question, because immediately those people are looking at me, and they're ready to shoot their arm up to answer that question. Right? Put yourself in a position of a high school student that doesn't know the answer. What do you do? Your first reaction is to look down. Try to avoid eye contact at any cost. Right? You're flipping through your notes. You're lo looking very philosophically out the window. Uh, because you feel as though if you make eye contact, that teacher is going to call on you. So if we want to exude confidence, if we want to make a positive impact on people, Use eye contact. Look them directly in the eyes when you're talking to them. Um, the third thing that I tell students uh, is to have a firm handshake. Have a good handshake. And I think that when we talk about a handshake, uh, the best way for us to understand what a good handshake is, is to think back about uh, or to think upon handshakes that we've had with individuals that have been very poor. And I have this kind of gruesome picture of a fish up here because inevitably we've all, we've all shook hands with someone whose their hand felt like a dead fish. It was kind of cold. It was kind of clammy. Right? There wasn't much give back on that. So we certainly don't want to shake someone's hand like a dead fish. All right? We've probably all uh, shook someone's hand that they just touched the edge of your fingers and they were that 
finger waggler there, right? And you just think, this person is shaking my fingers, not necessarily the hand. And you have no idea what your interaction is with that particular person. On the flip side of that, you've had the bone crusher. Specifically, those teenage boys, I want to show you how tough they are. And they just really squeeze that hand, and they can't even talk because they're taking all their energy into shaking that particular hand. All right? So we know what we don't want to do to have a good handshake. What do we want to do? And I'll pull out my trusty prosthetic hand here uh, to exemplify to you uh, a good handshake. A good handshake starts at contact. All right? And what you want to do is you want to match up that webbing between your thumb and your index finger to the webbing on that other hand. And to me, it's magical. It almost makes a noise. Bam. 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 I'm webbed to web on that particular handshake. Now, don't do as some of my students have done in the past when I've explained this to them. They said, after their senior exit interviews, they came into class the next day and they were so happy. They said, I made a great handshake. And as soon as I walked in, I said to Mr. Bruckner, bam. <laughs> and he looked at him like he was crazy. What's going on? So in your head, just make the noise, bam. Okay? So we go web to web on the handshake. All right? We want that handshake to be firm. We want to find a balance between the bone crusher and the finger waggler there, right? It's kind of like a good mattress, right? You want a mattress that's firm, but you don't want a mattress that's too stiff, all right? You want a mattress that's comfy, but not just too loose. So your handshake is the same way. You want it firm, you want it comfortable. And then adopt that previous step, all right, in marrying your eyes, meeting the eyes of that person you're shaking hands with, and repeat their name. Lastly, the fourth thing that you can do is pay attention to detail. You want to press to impress. You want the pleats in your pants. You want the nice iron shirt. All right? Uh, you can't lose when you match your belt to your shoes. All right? Ladies, you want to accessorize to mesmerize. You want to match your shoes to your jewelry to your outfit, but oh, don't overdo that. Now, you might be thinking, what does this middle-aged, hair follically challenged gentleman know about style? And I just have to plug or toot my own horn here. <laughs> Being a Baldwin graduate, in 1994, I was voted best dressed in that senior class. So obviously, I have a lot of clout when it comes to paying attention to detail and S-T-Y-L-E. Now, the, once we've mastered these Simple things that we can do within seven seconds uh, of meeting someone. Uh, what we should do in our lives, and what my challenge to all of you is, is the PTG. And PTG is an acronym I made up a few years ago. It stands for Play the Game. And uh, I think it's something that oftentimes we lose sight of. And I had an experience with my son this past weekend uh, that really exemplifies what it means to PTG and what we all need to do and adopt in our lives. This past Saturday was opening day of Little League Baseball season. And my son is really into sports. He slept in his uniform the night before opening day. And we're in the car on a beautiful Saturday morning driving to the baseball field. And I said to my son, I said, Eli, why do you like playing baseball? And he said, I like it because it's fun. And I said, okay. And I wanted to press him a little bit more, see really what was motivating him uh, to play baseball. And I said, well, what else do you like? It's fun. What else? And he said, I like to win. Now, unfortunately, in six-year-old Little League Baseball, they don't keep score of the game. So he never wins on the scoreboard. But after that game on Saturday, as he sat on the hillside in his uniform, with the slide marks of his four slides into home plate, sipping his Capri Sun, eating his Cheetos. He had a smile on his face because he was a winner in his mind. He got to do something that he had fun with. And I think that a lot of us, as we get older, we lose sight of that, that life is a game, that we are put here to have fun, and we need to enjoy it that we need to play to win. And we get so caught up in the ups and the downs of life that we forget to do those two important principles in playing the game. Have fun 
and win. So everyone sitting here that's seeking more satisfaction, that wants to get more out of life, just remember those three little letters, PTG, play the game. And go out and have fun and play to win.